If you're an athlete striving for a high level, then this is a very important concept that you have to be aware of. That is the energy systems. Before you even consider making a strength and conditioning plan or following one for that matter, you should at least know the basics of the energy systems. It's almost like what accounting would be for an accountant. This is the language of conditioning. Instead of trying to figure things out for yourself, this will give you a starting point. And yeah, I know I've talked about this in my past videos, but this will be more in depth. So to do any kind of work, you need energy, of course. The food you eat will give you the nutrients and the nutrients will be converted to ATP and the ATP will be broken down and energy will be provided for an activity. ATP basically powers all the biological work in your body, including muscular contractions. It's often referred to as a kind of currency in your body. Why so, you may ask? First of all, when this ATP is produced, it will be stored in the muscle cell until it's needed for a future muscular contraction, for example, any kind of activity. It's almost like you're getting paid and you're storing your money in your wallet for future use. So to perform any kind of muscular action, ATP, it has to be broken down into its original components with an enzyme called ATPase. It is then broken down into ADP, a phosphate, and in addition to that, energy will be released. And this energy will then be used for a muscular contraction to happen. Basically, it's like paying for a service with your money. In this case, ATP is like the dollars. And this ATP that is stored in the muscle, it's limited. So your body has to continually produce those ATP like some fast working factory to be able to continue work. One light muscular contraction might not be enough. We might have a race to run, some heavy weights to lift. We might have a boxing match, a football game, whatever. It doesn't matter. ATP needs to continually be provided because it's limited in the muscle once again, over and over again, throughout an activity. And this ATP in your body can be restored with three different energy systems, depending on the task. We have the fast-working phosphagen system, the glycolytic system, the oxidative system. Think of them as different factories that produce this same product, the ATP, but with different methods. And they all have their pros and cons, which we'll go into later, of course. Let's start with our first factory, the phosphagen system, otherwise known as the ATP PCR system. And this obviously is our fastest factory. It produces ATP faster than any of the other energy systems, and that is because it only requires one enzymatic reaction. However, it burns out quickly too, because our phosphagen stores are limited in the body. And also the phosphagen system is anaerobic, which means it's not dependent on oxygen. So if you're doing a very high effort task, your body simply won't have enough time to provide muscles with adequate oxygen, so it needs to rely on a system that doesn't need oxygen, that is anaerobic. And this system is obviously not activated unless the intensity is very high. Like we talked about earlier, for an action to happen, the ATP that you have stored is broken down into its original components, ADP and P, and then energy is provided. But in this case, we're doing something very intense, like we're doing a maximal high effort 100 meter sprint, we're doing a heavy lift, anything. So we need energy in a very fast manner, of course. And this is where phosphocreatines come to the rescue. So one phosphocreatine is split into phosphate and creatine through an enzyme called creatine kinase. And the phosphate is then added to the ADP that's left from before. And we have a new ATP. Bam, just like that. Now, we don't need to go into this concept on precise molecular level. Just know that phosphocreatine is mainly used as fuel for this system. And this process will keep repeating itself for as long as the phosphocreatine stores last. ATP is broken down, which leads to ADP and phosphate concentrations rising. And then phosphocreatines are broken down to form additional ATP from those previous products. In essence, if you do a max effort activity and this system gets activated... Around 10 ADPs will be produced per second and provide the muscles with ATP like a machine gun. Just bam, bam, bam until the phosphocreatine stores run out. And it's very limited, of course. Only about 15 seconds, which we'll go into later too. And yeah, we have a very small store of those phosphocreatines. Generally speaking, it's about 80 millimoles of kilogram per decimeter of dry weight. And that's not a lot. Like I said, it will only provide enough max effort activity for about 10 to 15 seconds. They are drained very fast and they will take quite a while to recover again. And once again, this system is not activated unless the intensity of the work is extremely high. It's like your fastest 
backup system. It would be unnecessary to call upon that if you're doing a very light activity like holding a pen and writing a letter or something. So if you have ever heard of the term power training or explosive training, it's probably the phosphagen system that is covered. And in those training methods, you usually have to go max effort to activate this system predominantly. So what are some practical examples where the phosphagen system is predominantly used? Any sprinting event that's within the power equation, under 100 meter. You're attempting a new record on the back squat, the deadlift or the bench press, any compound lift close to your maximal capacity. And all power oriented events in track and field in general, like discus throw, javelin throw, shot put, long jump, anything, anything that really lasts for a couple of seconds with maximal effort will predominantly activate this system. And here is a little graph that shows how the ATP PCR system, the rate of ATP per second, how it's so much higher than the other systems. We have 10 ATP units produced per second. And it makes you think like, of course it's going to be saved for when the activity is very demanding and very high. If you've ever played one of those video games on a PlayStation like Need for Speed, you remember when you pressed the button and you got this nitro boost and your car got super fast for a couple of seconds and then it's off and needs to recover again. Well, it's almost the same principle here in the phosphogen system. And once again, very important concept. The phosphogen system, it will not kick in unless the intensity of the exercise is very high to sub-maximal, even maximal. Any kind of lifting, whether you're doing light or heavy, throwing, jumping, running, it doesn't matter. High effort, mental effort that is, and a high intensity, it is a must. I see videos on the internet all the time with different kind of personal trainers or strength and conditioning coaches, whatever you want to call them. And they title the video like power training or plyometric training. And you see them performing an exercise very lightly with very minimal effort and... I mean, that's not power training because it's not going to engage this phosphagen system. It will not kick in unless the intensity is very high. If you take it easy on those workouts, you're only going to use the aerobic system because the body is smart. It's not stupid. It's going to say like, oh, this is, not, this is not high effort enough. I don't need to call upon our strongest system. And this is a big mistake that's very often made by qualified personnel that you would expect higher of. So don't make this mistake. If you're training for power... Remember that high mental effort and intensity is a must. And in this little graph here we can see how phosphocreatine concentrations and ATP production goes hand in hand. If you're doing a very high effort activity as you can see, ATP will be highest in the first couple of seconds and then it will narrowly decline there as the phosphocreatine levels drop. At 14, 15 seconds, somewhere like that, your phosphocreatines will be almost drained out. It's never completely drained out because it's needed for other biological processes, but it will be insignificant. Then after that, your body needs to rely on another energy system, which is the glycolytic system, which we'll go into later, of course, as well. Now, phosphocreatine availability in the body is likely a big contributor to be able to perform repeated high-effort activities. And this is a reason creatine is taken as supplementation. And creatine is actually a very... It's actually a very research subject and it's often very positive findings regarding the increases of performance in explosive activities. But once again, nothing is written in stone because some people respond bigger to it and some people might not respond at all to it. It's hard to say exactly. Now the phosphagen system is anaerobic in nature. However, interestingly, it appears that the restoration of this system is through the aerobic metabolism, that is oxygen. So when it comes to the recovery of it, if the availability of oxygen is high, your phosphocreatine systems will probably recover faster as well. So you have to be in a low effort or a resting state for this system to recover. Now it's pretty hard to say exactly how long it takes for the phosphocreatine stores to be completely recovered as this is dependent on many factors. For instance, how effective is your oxidative metabolism? How much did you actually deplete your PCR stores? Because to deplete yourself completely and give your everything is not an easy task, and this is a skill. But very generally speaking, if you want to generalize, after two or three minutes, your phosphocreatine levels will be recovered pretty significantly. And for 100% restoration, considering you gave your everything, which is rarely the case, it may take up to eight minutes. 
And additionally, some studies they suggest that athletes with a good aerobic capacity may recover faster after high effort activity. Now, this doesn't exactly mean that, like if you're a power athlete, like a 100 meter sprinter, an Olympic weightlifter, that you have to mess around with a bunch of 10 kilometer runs or marathons for that matter. It simply means that you'll recover faster if you have an improved aerobic base. You have to consider the nature of the sport and just how important this PCR recovery is. For example, if you if you are like a 100 meter sprinter once again, then PCR recovery is probably a little bit important, but not that much important. However, if you're a wrestler or a boxer who compete multiple times a day, you have to have a very high power output throughout the match in a, com- in a matter of minutes, then yes, probably PCR recovery is more important. And then, once again, you do- even in that case, you don't even have to do like 10 kilometer runs or do a marathon because short high intensity intervals is probably enough. And for the purpose of PCR recovery, those high intensity intervals they are favorable compared to medium effort like steady state cardio for the simple fact that they will train both the aerobic system and the anaerobic system at the same time. It's two birds in one stone. Steady state aerobic training, it will only emphasize the aerobic capacity alone, like mostly. Our second system is the anaerobic glycolytic system, otherwise known as fast glycolysis. It is not as powerful as the phosphagen system, but it lasts way longer, making it our second fastest factory. And just like the phosphagen system, this one is also anaerobic, and both of them being desirable in that case because they allow you to continue your high effort activities despite a limited oxygen supply. This system's fuel comes from blood glucose and glycogen stores. Those are then broken down and generated into energy in the form of ATP once again, giving it the name glycolysis. Now this glycolysis involves a little more steps than the previous phosphagen system that only required one step. This one requires 10 to 12 enzymatic reactions, making it a little bit slower than the phosphagen system therefore, obviously. Now don't be scared by this image, it's a lot simpler than you think, I'm gonna explain everything. And we don't, actually we don't need to go into all of it, let's just focus on the important parts and simplify it. So this process begins with a glucose or a glycogen and then they go through several enzymatic reactions with various byproducts on the way to finally produce that ATP once again that we're after that can be used for an activity, a muscular contraction, anything. If a glucose is broken down we get two ATPs and if a glycogen is broken down we get three ATPs. And along with this ATP lactic acid is also produced as a byproduct. And following the lactic acid, hydrogen ions are also released into the muscle cell and it raises acidity. And that is why it burns like hell when you're doing a very high effort activity for a very long time when you go fast pace. And that's one of the limitations with this system. And interestingly, for a long time it was thought that lactic acid was responsible for giving you this acidity in your muscles, but no, it's actually the hydrogen ions that are released into the blood. So what are some examples of activities that predominantly activate the anaerobic glycolytic system? It could be a sprinting event between 200 to 400 meters. That's very demanding of anaerobic glycolysis. We have downhill skiing like alpine skiing, giant slalom especially, a wrestling match, a very high effort boxing match. Basically, any high effort activity that lasts from 30 seconds to 120 seconds, under 2 minutes that is. It will begin with the phosphagen system, and then when the phosphagen system runs out, you can go over to the anaerobic glycolytic system for up to two minutes. And to measure the effects of the anaerobic glycolysis, it's very popular to make a blood lactate test. A blood lactate test can be conducted. If the lactate levels get high after an activity, it means that the anaerobic glycolytic system was very dominating. At resting levels are... Lactate levels are normally about 1 minimal per kilogram per liter of blood. However, after a very demanding activity, and now I'm talking about maximal effort, like some Olympic gold match in wrestling, a downhill skiing event, a very high effort activity, they can get up to 25. And in extreme cases, and this has actually been recorded in one study, they can get to 30. And this is a huge level. So let's say you're going to run up a hill or something. You start nice and easy utilizing the aerobic capacity because it's not very demanding and then you increase the pace more and more and you will slowly shift out of the aerobic system and into the anaerobic glycolytic system 
because the pace will become too high. Your aerobic system won't be able to keep up and provide with enough oxygen. It needs to shift into the anaerobic. And as soon as this lactate, it begins to accumulate dramatically, we're in the so-called lactate threshold. And this is where the transition from predominantly aerobic happens to the anaerobic. And as you can see in this graph here, in untrained people, the lactate threshold is anywhere between 50 to 60% of aerobic capacity, also known as the VO2 max that you've probably heard about. In elite endurance athletes, however, it can be as high as 80% or 75, around that before it shifts to the anaerobic system. So if you're an elite athlete, an elite endurance athlete, what would you naturally want to do? You would want to increase this threshold, of course. You don't want to predominantly, or prematurely, that is, transition into the anaerobic. You want to stay in the aerobic for as long as you possibly can before it happens. Because it's simply more efficient. It's like you're getting something for a discount. So what is our goal when training the anaerobic glycolytic system? We want to train ourselves to withstand this acidic feeling that builds up and possibly delay it. Now when we train the system, we will increase the enzymatic activity that is responsible for breaking down the various byproducts when utilizing the anaerobic glycolysis. And those enzymes are phosphorylase, PFK, and PDH. And one method to improve the following adaptations is through short and intensive interval trainings with longer rest periods. We want to keep the sets very short, like 30 seconds perhaps, and have the rest periods around minutes because we want to give it all we got during those short activity and really make those lactate levels build up and just train ourselves to withstand that. That is the essence of lactic acid training or anaerobic glycolytic training, any of the term you want to use. Now here's an important point. If you're going to utilize this glycolytic system, glucose and glycogen stores need to be available because it is the fuel. And to a good extent, this is linked to the carbohydrates available in your diet. And accordingly, if you follow a low carbohydrate diet, like those low carb, high fat diets, whatever you want to call them, your glycogen stores might be affected by this and your performance in high effort activities will be in turn negatively affected. Generally speaking, if the activity is medium to even intense, then glycogen and glucose are required, of course. And as we went through in the start, if the intensity is maximal, for the first few seconds we need phosphocreatines. Very low effort aerobic training, however, will be able to use additional sources like fats. And we will go into this later. Uh, yeah, I know I've said we're going to go into a lot of stuff later, but trust me, just trust me. And after training, glycogen levels need to be resynthesized so that we can continue working hard again another day. Which is then discussed in my video, training recovery and adaptation in case you haven't watched that. If glycogen is not restored, your performance will be negatively affected. And once again, this may be partly linked to the carbohydrates in your diet. When muscle glycogen stores are low, you will feel sore for longer and your strength is affected. Basically, the time that is required for your body to recover and adapt from soreness will be prolonged if glycogen stores are lacking. This is why it is often a recommendation that carbs are consumed within two hours after exercise. In this case, glycogen stores can increase by 45%. And if you're an athlete participating in tournaments with multiple matches in the same day, like a wrestler or a boxer, this point becomes even more important. You have to understand that food and carbs especially, it's not just something you shove into your mouth to deal with hunger. It's actually energy. It's what gasoline is for a car or electricity if you're watching this from the future. You need energy basically, right? Simple. We don't need to complicate it more than that. Eat your goddamn food. Now, our last system is the oxidative system, aka the aerobic system. And this is our slowest factory, but of course it also has its good side, it's also the most endurant one. If you need a slow and steady supply for a very long time, from a consistent factory that doesn't burn out quickly, this is the one to go with. And this system is active with the help of oxygen. And for oxygen to be helpful, the activity level it needs to be relatively low. So considering you've done a very high effort activity for two minutes, after the two minute mark, the shift goes from predominantly the anaerobic glycolysis to the oxidative system. And this system is regarded as the 
most complex of all of them, but I will do to the best of my abilities to give you a simplified explanation. The oxidative system can also use blood glucose and glycogen as fuel sources for the production of ATP, under the availability of oxygen of course. And unlike the glycolytic system where the ATP is produced in the cytoplasm, the ATP in the production of the oxidative system happens in the mitochondria, the famous powerhouse of the cell that you probably heard a thousand times if you study some kind of medicine. So when is this system used? Like we talked about earlier, the oxidative system is the least powerful in your body, but it is also the longest lasting. So any medium to low effort activity between two minutes and over three hours and up to a day even uses this system which makes it desirable for endurance events. Generally speaking, the longer the sporting event or the activity, the more important this system becomes. So any medium to long distance running event, a 5k, 10k, marathon, ultramarathon, Nordic skiing, biathlon, swimming, 800 meters to 1,500 meters, like basically any moderately demanding activity that lasts over two minutes will emphasize this system predominantly. It's quite, it's quite broad. It will be of importance in an 800 meter sprint. It will be even more important in a 5k and it will be of utmost importance in a marathon. So why is this system so complex? Well, because for it to break down carbohydrates, it involves three steps and each step containing its own various reactions. It's a lot of reactions and this is only the simplified version that you see in the picture here. We have aerobic glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Oxidative production of ATP has to go through all of those steps, which can explain why this system is so slow at generating ATP. I know what you're thinking. Didn't we just go through the glycolysis? Why is it mentioned here as well? Well, because there is anaerobic glycolysis and aerobic glycolysis. In anaerobic glycolysis that we talked about earlier, Glucose and glycogen is broken down without the presence of oxygen. Here in aerobic glycolysis, it happens with the help of oxygen. Now initially the process of glycolysis is the same regardless of whether oxygen is present or not. However, the fate of the end product, pyruvate, is determined by the presence of oxygen. In anaerobic glycolysis, the pyruvate is converted into lactic acid as we talked about earlier, but here... In aerobic glycolysis, it will be converted into acetyl-coenzyme A, or acetyl-CoA. Once this acetyl-CoA is formed, it will then enter the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle, as you can see here. And this is just one part of the oxidative system, and this part alone already has all of those different enzymatic reactions. So once again, no wonder this system is so slow at producing ATP. So if we go a little bit more in depth into this Krebs cycle, we can see here that GTP is formed, which is almost like a predecessor to ATP in this case. It will then transport a phosphate to ADP and bam, we have an ATP. And in addition to the Krebs cycle, we also have the electron transport chain as our last step. During this glycolysis, when glucose is converted into pyruvate, hydrogen ions are also released. And when pyruvate is converted into acetyl-CoA, Hydrogen ions are released as well. It happens during various steps. So obviously those hydrogen ions, they have to go somewhere. They can't just remain there. Otherwise the environment, it will become too acidic. So what happens? They go to the electron transport chain. And inside those are protein structures that are located in the membrane of the mitochondria once again. The NADH and the FADH2 that are produced, they will carry over those hydrogen ions to the electron transport chain. And all of those series of processes and enzymatic reactions, they will give us ATP in the end, which is what we're after. This is a short explanation of it. And the end products here are obviously not lactate like it is in the anaerobic glycolysis. In this case, it's the aerobic glycolysis. So our end products will be carbon dioxide and water, CO2 and H2O. But wait, it doesn't end here because the aerobic system is also capable of using fat as a fuel source. We have about 2,500 calories worth of glycogen stores. But fats, on the other hand, they make up to 70,000 to 75,000 calories, and that is pretty significant, a lot more, obviously. 
So if you were trapped in a desert island, for example, and you have to live there without food, maybe you only have water, then you would last for a long time because of your fat stores, obviously. And those data, it is only based on a person with a 75 kilograms of body weight and 12% body fat, just 12%. And obviously for most sports, 2,500 calories will be just plenty. This is mostly useful for athletes of ultra-endurance sports or activities that can last for hours. You know, like 100 kilometers or 2 hours run, 10 hours run or up to even a day. There are many sources of fat, but generally speaking only triglycerides are used as energy sources. To oxidize fat and produce ATP... A triglyceride is split into its original components, one glycerol and three free fatty acid molecules. And the splitting happens through an enzyme called lipase. And this process of burning fats and using it as energy is known as lipolysis, instead of the glycolysis that I talked about earlier, because now we use lipids, hence the name lipolysis. And once those free fatty acids are separated, they can then enter the bloodstream, And they finally end up in the muscle fibers. And once again, just as if those fatty acids had been glucose or glycogen, they also have to be converted into acetyl-CoA before they can be used for energy. And this process is called beta-oxidation. Once they are converted, they will then enter the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle once again to form ATP, just like if they were glucose. And the rest of the process... Yeah, it happens the same as the previous aerobic glycolysis that I talked about. It ends with the electron transport chain, ATP is finally produced, along with the byproducts of H2O and CO2. Now to break down those fatty acids, it requires a lot of oxygen, much more than if it were glucose. And that is because those fatty acids, they contain more carbon molecules. But because they contain more carbon, they will also have more acetyl-CoA. And ultimately, we will be rewarded with more energy per free fatty acid molecule. As you can see here, from fat, one fatty acid, we get around 100 ATPs, and that is a lot. Now, whether fat or glucose or glycogen is used depends entirely on the intensity of the activity and the length. For most endurance sports, it's probably glucose or glycogen stores that are used predominantly. Fats are only used, once again, if we're running on a very moderate or low pace, And this happens once again in only endurance, like ultra-endurance sports, like those who last hours and even days. For those athletes, utilizations of fat is desirable because their events can last for that long. And then glycogen and glucose stores simply won't be enough. Fats need to be used as well. The specific intensity at which an athlete will start using fat as fuel appears to be highly individual. And this is known as the fat zone or the fat max. Just some interesting fact, I'm not going to go into it that much because it's a pretty complex issue, but it's good to know about it. Now this is important. All of the energy systems, they contribute to ATP production. None of them work independently. It's not like one is turned off, then one gets turned on again. No, all of them are active at all times. But depending on the demands, they will be active at various degrees. Let's play with a little scenario here. Imagine you're going to run... 2 kilometers with as much effort as you possibly can from start to finish. No particular strategy, just raw grit, as powerful as you can, start to finish. For the first 10 to 15 seconds, you will probably be the fastest and the most powerful because it's the fossil fuel system that is active and you're using your fossil creating stores as fuel. After 15 seconds or so, those fossil creating stores are too low, so your body needs to rely on other fuel sources. So it's time to shift into another system and that would be the anaerobic glycolytic system and this would then last for approximately two minutes since the start of the activity and you would still be considerably powerful here but not as powerful as the phosphogen system and lactic acid will soon after start to build up pretty drastically those hydrogen ions will enter your blood and make your muscles acidic you will feel the sour slow feeling in you and you will slowly transition over to the aerobic glycolysis So after two minutes, it will start to shift over to the aerobic system pretty dramatically. And three to four minutes or so in, it will be almost completely aerobic, with very minimal interference from the anaerobic system. And this will go on until you finish the remaining distance of the race. Obviously, it will not be nearly as fast as the previous two systems, but you can go on for much longer. That is the advantage. 
And all of this, it can work in a reverse order as well. Say you take it easy the first couple of minutes, just using very moderate activity through your aerobic system, like some light jogging. And then you decide to give it all you got, utilizing only the anaerobic system now, like the phosphogen system or the glycolytic system for as long as it lasts, before shifting back to the slow aerobic system once again to build back your phosphocreatine stores once again and getting the lactate out of your body, all of the hydrogen ions out, before you decide to give it another sprint. And this is basically the essence of interval training. There's a lot of strategies to manipulate those energy systems. So yeah, as an end note, all of those systems, they obviously have their pros and cons. I mean, if you are, it entirely depends on your sport. Like, why do you need to know all of this, you may ask? Let's say you're a sprinter. Like, you need to know how to train specifically for your sport. If you're a sprinter, a track and field athlete that utilizes a lot of power, you need to train the appropriate energy system, or rather prioritize the appropriate system. If you're a martial artist like a boxer or a wrestler, you maybe need a mix of everything. It's your job as an athlete and your coach to know those energy systems and analyze them and see what you need and what you need to prioritize for your specific sport and you have to take control of this. You see athletes all the time, they are prioritizing the wrong energy systems. Like, They are all required of course but they are required to varying degrees. Do you find it tricky to condition yourself for a particular sporting activity? Well, the knowledge of it starts here in the energy systems. This is the frameworks for exactly that. Like I said, it is like what accounting would be for an accountant. This is where you start. 